The first unit introduced us to the science of biology, and we looked at the smallest components of living things, atoms and molecules. We saw the order and organization of these components. We learned how water helps to maintain the conditions necessary for life, and at the same time is reactive, which keeps energy flowing. We learned that carbon is essential for life, and there's a lot of ways for carbon to be assembled. Lots of ways to put carbon together incorrectly, but if we get the basic elements assembled, a world of myriad different types of life emerge, though almost entirely from four basic macromolecules. In this second unit, we are moving up in scale. This unit is about cells and how cells use those molecules to be alive, to make the it happen. In other words, energy processing. So let's take a spin around the cell. This is another big chapter, so we'll take it in two parts. Here are the learning objectives, the first few, and we'll get through all of these, and the second set of, uh, second part of the learning objectives, and we'll get in this first part of the lecture down to about number 11, and then we'll wrap up with the other, the rest of them in part two. As I told you back in chapter one, a cell is the least possible thing you can consider to be truly alive. All living organisms are made of at least one cell, and for many, many organisms, that's all you get, one cell. As we saw with biological molecules, the relatively simple structure of the cell has been modified into hundreds of different shapes and forms that are correlated with their function. And one of the central tenets of cell theory Omnis cellula a cellula, all cells are descended from prior cells. That all life is made of cells, and all cells come from other cells, that is what is known as cell theory, as proposed by Virchow. Cells are small. Why? Well, of course, we as multicellular organisms must be larger than our component cells. But cells are tiny. There aren't many kinds of cells that we can resolve with the naked eye. A cell made of molecules has to be able to regulate all of those tiny molecules. Cells are three-dimensional, so the stuff of a cell, the it, the surfaces, which can increase at the power of n squared, need to maintain empty space that increases at a rate of n cubed, or 10 times as quickly. In order to maintain a large volume, it's simpler to use more cells rather than to try and occupy an unmanageable volume. In this image, what you can see is three cubes. The smallest on the left is one by one by one. The units don't really matter. It could be a micron, it could be a mile. The volume of this cube is one, and the six square faces each one by one. So the surface to volume ratio is six to one. In the middle is a cube of dimension five by five by five. The volume is five cubed or 125 and each face is five by five. And there are six faces to the surface area. So do, 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 150. This means the surface to volume ratio has shrunk from six to 1.2. Cube three is like cube two in size, but made out of cube one each of those little cubes maintains the same surface area, but now they occupy a greater volume, thus maintaining a high surface to volume ratio. This image shows basically the same thing, only using the red color to show how tiny particles can cover an area, but have much more surface area to maintain it. One more example, which I hope will bring the point home. Have you ever wondered why does football happen with 11 players to a side on a 100-yard field? What if each side only had five players, like basketball? Or what if the field were 100 miles long with those same 11 players? Something to think about and how it relates to the previous topic. Before we get into our tour of the cell, we're going to take a brief behind-the-scenes look at how we know about cells. First, we're going to talk a bit about microscopy. Cells, as we have just established, are small. Almost all the time, they are too small for the unaided eye to see. 
Compared to where we just were, talking about molecules, cells are relatively big, seeing as they're made out of thousands of different kinds of macromolecules. So at least we have tools to see our cells, though biochemistry is also important for studying cell biology. Microscopy is the technique that first revealed the fundamental truth of life as a cellular process. The reason we call the little chambered bits of life cells is because an observer, Robert Hooke, looking at plant tissue under a microscope, thought they looked like the chambers of a honeycomb, also called cells. The earliest type of microscopy, and still the kind you encounter in most labs, is light microscopy. In our labs, we use light microscopes of two kinds. A dissecting microscope, which magnifies, but not enough to see the cells, and a compound microscope, like in the picture here, which requires a translucent specimen so that light can pass through it and then through a series of magnifying lenses. The curved glass lenses bend the light, and that's how we get magnification. Speaking of magnification, that's the thing microscopy is really known for, the ability to produce an image that exaggerates the size of an object, like this robber fly. I don't know what size your screen is, but probably it's safe to say that you will never see a robber fly this close up. I can take this magnified image, and I can magnify it even more so we can get a better look at the facets of the robber fly's compound eyes. The image is still pretty crisp and clear, so let's magnify it some more. You can tell that we're still looking at the fly's eye, but if I showed you this picture first, you might have thought it was abstract art. What happened? We've maxed out on the resolution or the ability to resolve or distinguish between points. In the digital world, images are comprised of pixels. A pixel is just a series of ones and zeros that assign a color to a small area. I can't continue to zoom in until I see the individual cells that make up the facet of the fly's compound eye, because any more magnification and there will be no resolution. Here's another way to think about resolution. Imagine you are walking along an unlit road at night. Spooky. You see a light coming towards you. A car. Maybe. You only see one light source. As it gets closer, at a certain point, the light resolves into two headlights. Or maybe not. Maybe it's a motorcycle and the lights never resolve into two. It speeds past you and you see the twin red tail lights get smaller as they whiz away and then dissolve into a single red blur. In order to keep magnifying, you need to increase resolution as well. A third important parameter of microscopy is contrast. Back to the robber fly. You can see that I've tinkered with the image and brought the contrast down. What is the effect? It has become more difficult to see as though the fly were in a haze or a fog. It's still magnified and the resolution is the same, but it is still less clear than before. So what can microscopes do for us? Consider this image. What does it show us? The scale on the left over here is a logarithmic scale, just like the pH scale. So up on top here, here's 10 meters, or a football first down marker in Canada, slightly shorter in America. The next horizontal line down, down here, is 1 meter, or 39 inches, a little more than a yard. Then a tenth of a meter, and a hundredth, and a thousandth, and at the bottom, a ten thousandth of a meter. Some cells are on this page and can be seen with the unaided eye. I feel like we used to call it the naked eye, but whatever. Moving on down in scale, we can see how microscopy can help us to see things that our eyes cannot resolve. Again, logarithmic scale over here on the left. Some key things to notice. First, in case you haven't met, this letter here, is the Greek letter mu, which kind of looks like a U. And that indicates a micron, or one micrometer, which is a millionth of a meter, or 10 to the negative sixth meters. This yellow band here, between uh, one micron up to 100 microns, which is a, a tenth of a millimeter, is the size of most plant and animal cells down to the size of most bacterial cells. 
and the sizes of some of the larger cell parts. Light microscopy, the blue double-headed arrow on the right here, can aid our eyes to see those things, down to almost 100 nanometers, or 100 billionths of a meter. Looking at the purple arrow, electron microscopy, we can resolve living things down to a few billionths of a meter, including some very large single macromolecules. Light microscopy is the typical kind of microscopy that you would perform in a laboratory. The magnification is contingent on the lenses that you have available. These top four images over here are all of the same thing. Epithelial cells, such as you might find lining your own cheeks. The first image here is of epithelial cells, straight out of the cheek, viewed with bright field microscopy, or just plain old white light microscopy. The microscopes you find in teaching labs are equipped for bright field microscopy. Here is a great example of poor contrast, or a bad example of good contrast. Either way, you can see that there are cells in here and can even see the nuclei of those cells, but they're very difficult to see, almost like cell ghosts. What is your unfinished business? To really make these cells pop, we can add a stain. There are a huge number of different stains that can be used that bind to different types of biological molecules and make only those particular compounds stand out. For example, if you want to see fungi growing in a sample of plant tissue, we know that fungi have chitinous cell walls and plants have cellulose cell walls. So if we use a stain that only binds the chitin, that's what we'll see. An effect of using stains is that they are often cytotoxic, or in other words, they kill the cells. Sometimes that's desirable because the cells may become fixed at a stage where they are stuck in time, like a photograph. But if they're dead, we can't see how they function. There's a couple of options to deal with that. Both involve using different lenses to change the way the light gets to the eye. One is phase contrast. You can see how the unstained cells have a bit more pop to them, even though they aren't stained. Another is Nomarski illumination or differential interference contrast. It's okay to laugh at the acronym though I hear it referred to as DIC for obvious reasons. DIC gives the unstained cells an almost three-dimensional appearance. Like phase contrast, DIC can be used with the living cells so we can observe them in action. One more type of light microscopy, and it's my favorite. Fluorescence microscopy uses stains that glow or fluoresce under ultraviolet light. Again, Different stains bind to different biological molecules. DAPI is a brilliant blue fluorescent stain that binds to DNA specifically, and other stains bind to other biomolecules, making them appear as orange and green in this image. Does it remind you of a glow party down there? That's no coincidence. The principle is largely the same. So-called black lights are ultraviolet lights, and the colors are produced by fluorescence. Fluorescence microscopy can give us more magnification and resolution than bright field microscopy. But in order to see the really small parts of cells, we need something a little stronger. Electron microscopy, you may recall from a few slides ago, can resolve objects down to under 10 nanometers. These two types of electron microscopy are called scanning electron microscopy, or SEM, and transmission electron microscopy, or TEM. These two photomicrographs are of the same structure, cilia. Both of these types of microscopy use beams of electrons rather than light to produce an image. SEM uses a beam of electrons bounced off of the surface of a specimen. The result is an image that looks three-dimensional. This is similar to what we observe in a dissecting microscope with the light shining down from above. These images are produced in black and white, and then can be artificially colored after the fact. TEM also uses a beam of electrons, but rather than bouncing the electrons off of the surface, 
the beam is transmitted through the specimen, just like the light of a compound microscope. This gives a two-dimensional image, but with much better resolution and magnification. And as with SEM, the images are produced in black and white, but may be colored post hoc. 